Senko's how we doing this morning?
the surface of my anxious imagination beckons a calmness that is found in you alone it washes over every doubt every your presence is a comfort of my soul. There's no
Thank you. Enjoy the service.
Good morning. I am Susan Hickman. This is Brett Watson. Pastor is out today. So we are here to talk to you about patience. Okay, how many of y'all were just kind of like, okay, where's she going with this? Wrap it up, wrap it up. What's, what's happening? It illustrates the point well. It does. Yeah. Just so you know, they didn't let me do that bit because they knew you'd be expecting me to talk that way. Anyway, so. so Good to Chris- be here with you, though. Yeah, the Christmas season is up on us. And yes, so this is. is the first in the Christmas series. And the theme of of anticipation and waiting is is always one of the themes of the Christmas time. So that's what we're here to talk to you about today. Right. So um, I have a story that goes really well with the issue of waiting. Um, For those of you who don't know, my my wife and I had a habit years ago of adopting children. So we have five kids. Three of them are adopted. One is adopted domestically, uh, two are international from South Korea and then Uganda. So <clears throat> adopting involves a lot of anxious waiting, um, just like childbirth does. <laughs> um, but international adoption can be even longer. Uh, and adopting from Uganda has its own unique circumstances. So our youngest, Joseph, was adopted from Uganda And the reason that it's unique is because Uganda does not belong to this international treaty called the Hague Convention that oversees the protection of children from uh, child abduction and also uh, for adoption cases. And that whole convention makes things, if you're you're dealing with an adoption in a Hague um, country, as they say, then uh, the process is streamlined uh, because there's these agreements on checking the backgrounds of people and so on. So Uganda didn't belong to this. And so um, we were told early on, look, you're probably going to have to be in country for 10 to 14 days. Whereas in in our adoption of Ben, my second youngest, um, we didn't even have to go to South Korea because they were a Hague nation. Uh, So we thought, well, 10 days, 14 days, it's like a vacation, right, in Africa. It'll be exciting. It'll be a, an adventure. Well, <clears throat> um, as things went, we had a lot of unexpected delays. The first one occurred when we went to the Atlanta airport where we were to take off and go to Amsterdam. As I go to board the plane, I have my ticket, I hand it to the guy, and then I hand him my passport, and he looks at my passport, and the cover on my passport was tearing away from the rest of the book. So he looks up with this very sympathetic expression and he says, sir, I don't know how to tell you this, but I cannot let you on this plane with your passport like this. You're gonna have to get a new one. So I'm like, oh Lord, how long is that gonna take? Well, it just so happens that uh, Atlanta is one of three places in the country where you can get a passport in 24 hours. So we lucked out. People were great. They sped things along, and uh, we were off the next day. We only had to spend one night in Atlanta. So then we had the next wait, which was a little over eight hours flight to Amsterdam. We ended up having to spend the night there. Uh, And then we had a 10-hour-plus flight to um, Kampala. But what we didn't know is that the waiting was just now starting as we got there. (laughs) That's where the the real wait occurred. we were supposed to meet Je- uh, Jesus. We were supposed to meet Joseph. <laughs> He's a pretty Christ-like kid now. Um, not in Africa, though. So we get there, and, and we were supposed to actually meet Joseph at, on Thanksgiving Day, which we thought was going to be cool, but now we're like two days behind. Um, we finally get to meet him, and it was beautiful, and, um, and he got to come back with us to the compound where we were living. However, um, as we neared our court date, which was about a week later, um, we had to travel to Mbale, which is where Joseph is from in the country. And uh, the judge there was particularly afraid of kids ending up in, you know, human trafficking. And so 
he made it very clear that he was not in favor of the adoption, and he set the case on the back burner, so to speak. So after two weeks, it was clear we hadn't heard anything from him since then, and uh, so it was becoming very clear that we were in for a much longer stay than we expected. Meanwhile, we had gotten word that my mother-in-law was diagnosed with lung cancer. So here we are 8,000 miles away dealing with that stress, and so we made the decision that Arlene and, and Ben would fly back, and they did. We got to almost five weeks out, and I am running around the compound looking for Joseph yet again, who is, by the way, like a honey badger. So God knows what he's up to. Nobody on the staff can find him. He's just running around. So we don't know where he is. He's probably killing a big crow or something. He's always throwing rocks at birds and things. Can't find him. And I'm just exhausted. And I collapse on the bench underneath this um, gazebo out in the courtyard of the compound. And I said, Lord, it's official. This place is now called the Purgatory Garden. I had had it. I was so tired of waiting. I said, Lord, I just, you got to do something. I can't do this any longer. We did, it's not like we have endless money. We can't stay in Africa forever. So um, just as I got done complaining, I remembered something that occurred right after our court date. The judge had made it clear that he was putting things on the back burner. And so afterwards, Sister Mary, who was the director of Joseph's Orphanage, walks over to the two of us. We're very distraught. And she takes our hands and she says, I just want to say to you, God bless you for letting Joseph into your heart and your family. I want to tell you that he is the child always standing last at the gate, watching the vehicle drive away whenever a child was adopted. He has been waiting for you for four and a half years to be a part of your family. So remembering that, I said, okay, Lord, I get it. Gotcha. If I have to wait, I have to wait. Still called it purgatory, though. <laughs> so we know we've, we had to deal with a lot of waiting uh, going through that process. Yeah, thing. patience is not something that we practice anymore. We don't have to. You can order groceries. You can order something off of Amazon and get it the same day. I literally ordered something in the morning off of Amazon, and it arrived in the office yeah. by like 3.30. We don't even have to wait and wonder anymore. If we want to know something, we just ask. So, hey, Google, where did the uh, Christmas tree tradition come from? Here's a summary from history.com. Germany is credited with starting the... Yeah. Crazy. Don't have to go look it up. Lovely little Google. Right. So, unless like you were talking about adopting or, you know, having a baby, which is actually 10 months. I don't know why they call it nine months. It's every bit of 10 months. <laughs> yeah. But didn't y'all have like a ridiculous wait for Ben yeah. too? Longer than an elephant. 26 months we waited for Ben. That's a long time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's So waiting. Crazy. Well, it turns out that in the Bible, you, you have story after story of very real people like us. That's one of the unique things, by the way, about the Bible. Uh, the, the Jewish um, literature didn't hide the way that almost all other ancient stories hide the uh, faults of the, of the heroes in their stories. The Bible very uniquely um, didn't hide that stuff, and so they were often very impatient. Um, for example, you have Israel that was stuck in Egypt as slaves for 400 years. Once they get out, they spend 40 years, what should have taken three days to get to the promised land. They're 40 years wandering in the desert, not allowed to go in. And then you have stories like the story of Simeon or Abraham and Sarah. Abraham's promised a son. They had to wait till they were almost 100 years old before she got pregnant. So I want to read this from uh, Luke chapter 2. I have it up here for you. And this is the story of Simeon, who was waiting for the Messiah. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. 
It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went to the, into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. It's a beautiful story, and it's a good, um, it's a good lead into our first point, and it's this. We need to be patient and wait on God. Simeon was waiting for the consolation, the comforting of, Egypt, of Israel, rather, because Israel had been under the oppression of foreign rule forever. And so they were waiting for the one, the Messiah, to come and create a more God-centered society, if you will, to make Israel whole again. And it was a long wait. And so we have this season, right now we're in it, the church calls it Advent, which means coming. And it is, it's designed, the season was designed by the church many, many centuries ago to help us to remember that like Simeon, we are waiting for the world to be made whole. We are waiting on Jesus to be born into our hearts so that we can make this world whole. That's the meaning of this whole season. But waiting is difficult for most of us, isn't it? We have waiting rooms everywhere. If we go to the Jiffy Lube, car wash, doctors, hospitals, waiting is especially hard for us in this instant gratification kind of world that we've created. We don't even want to wait a minute for a red light. So I was at a red light one day and there was a car in front of me and a car behind me and the light turns green. The car behind me immediately honks its horn. So the car in front of me gave me a hand gesture, if you will. So at the next light, I pull Show up us. next to her. No, no, that's okay. Yikes. No, so at the next light, I pull up next to her, gave her a little finger motion of my own. No, no, it was roll down your window. And she's like, she's a young lady, she rolls down her window. And I said, that was not me that honked at you. You put that finger away, young lady. And she's like, I'm sorry. But we don't even want to appear to be impatient, yeah. you know, but we are. But we are, yeah. But we are. Uh, pastor Larry tells a cute story of a, of a pastor who was um, building a trellis for some vines on his house. And as he was building it, uh, he noticed that the neighbor boy was watching him, just staring, watching the whole thing. And so he was kind of flattered. And he looked down at the kid and he said, so, son, you picking up some pointers on how to build this stuff? And the kid said, no, I'm just waiting. What are you waiting for? I'm waiting to see what happens when a pastor hits his thumb. See what he says. Yeah. I can tell you as a pastor, he says the same thing everybody else does. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had uh, mentioned Abraham and Sarah a little bit ago. Um, and in fact, in that story, they did not wait on God. Uh, instead... Because they were growing so old, um, Sarah thought, well, maybe I'll just give him my, my slave girl, Hagar, as a concubine, and we'll have a son through her. So that's what they did, something I'm sure wouldn't fly too well today. No, because that was like old-fashioned in vitro fertilization. Yeah, I don't think that would work today. No. <laughs> no. Um, no. Well, what happens, though, is later Sarah does become pregnant, of course, and as a result, Hagar and Ishmael are looked on with contempt and thrown out of the community. So a lot of pain, a lot of unnecessary pain, having not waited on God. If they'd have just waited a little bit longer. Exactly. A lot of people don't know this. Um, many scholars think that the whole reason that Judas betrayed Jesus was an issue of impatience. Uh, many of them believe that Judas wanted to push Jesus into a conflict with his enemies uh, so that 
he would be forced to show his power. Because remember, he had been witness to all these miracles and so on. So I think that's probably accurate. So there you go. Look where I got him. But many of our problems, like with Judas or Abraham and Sarah, are problems that we end up creating in our impatience. We can't wait. And so we leap ahead of God instead of waiting for his chance to act. And that leads us to the second point. When you wait on God, you're not going to be disappointed. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit, the text said. It had been revealed to Simeon by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. It was revealed. It was a promise. And so what we see in this old man is that he had been waiting for all these years for Israel to be healed and for this leader, this Messiah, to be raised up. He waited is the point. He trusted God to fulfill what God said he would do. And that's what we want to encourage you guys with today. We want to encourage you to be patient, to wait on God. Wait for the right timing. Today, as we mentioned, we have a very difficult time doing this. It's not a popular thing. In fact, many people won't even pray for patience. <laughs> Don't pray for patience. He will make you He'll wait. He'll make you wait, yeah. Yeah. You've been doing a lot of that recently. I have. Um, so I shattered my shoulder. I fell and shattered my shoulder just because I wanted to be like Pastor Larry when I grew up. <laughs> but I am literally waiting for bone to grow. Like, it's like is worse that, than watching grass grow. It's like watching grass grow. But I was waiting for the sling to come off, and then I'm waiting for the swelling to go down. I'm just continually waiting. Yeah. And it is not easy. It, it just isn't. I noticed you had like these little T-Rex arms. I know, right? To do I do everything like a T-Rex. <laughs> Decorating the Christmas tree like that. All well, the decorations a- are from here down. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I had some friends help, maybe a little. For the there's, a, uh, there's a text that I thought would be good to encourage you and all that. Oh, yeah. That whole T-Rex thing. Thank you. It says there on uh, Isaiah that uh, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, lose their T-Rex arms. Oh, thank you. And, and shall mount up on wings as eagles. Thanks. That's great. So the, the truth is, all of it, I mean, all we have to do for most of us is we have to watch our own lives, and we can see that most people... Um, rather than waiting on God, like to force their own deadlines on him. I know that's true in my case. Um, And that leads me to this third point that I want to share with you. The fact is that God seems to work in his own timing. In fact, um, like we see in the story of, of Simeon, unlike Simeon, we don't want to wait on God's timing, but he always does things according to his own way. Uh, Simeon had to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and that's something that we, that's important for us to remember. This is a relational God that we're dealing with. We don't want to pretend that it's the same as our human relationships. It isn't. It's obviously different, but it is a relationship. It's something that's unique about the Christian view of things. And so, Being sensitive to the Holy Spirit is an important thing to develop in that relationship. It takes time and effort to do that. Prayer, meditation, uh, uh, meditating especially on on the Scriptures, all of these things really do condition the mind and the heart to wait on the Holy Spirit and to be sensitive to when he's moving. So that day, uh, Simeon took this child into his arms and he began to praise God for keeping his promise. Being sensitive to the Spirit allowed him to know now is the time. And so he takes him to his arms. Can you imagine what he must have been thinking? The thing that you'd been waiting for all of your life is actually becoming a reality as you take this child into your arms. And those beautiful words I think are worth reading again. Um, He says this, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, that's most of us, and the glory of your people Israel. 
So that day, what was a religious routine, really, for Mary, you took your child to be circumcised on the eighth day, um, became the fulfillment of a very profound promise for Simeon, but not just for Simeon, for all of us. That day, salvation was born. So, what Simeon had waited for all of his life had finally been actualized. God, will find, does not use calendars like we do. He does not go by reminder text. I got one literally this morning before I came up on stage for the 9 o'clock. It said, send such and such to Marty. I'm sorry, Marty. <laughs> that, was, that was a reminder from something I had on my to-do list <laughs> almost a week ago. Um, anyway, God doesn't use these things. Uh, God doesn't need those things. He is God. He makes the rules. Yeah, 2020 has been an exercise in some patience. When are we going to get out of quarantine? How long do we have to wear masks? When is the vaccine coming? Mm -hmm. When is the next season of Ozark? That's yes. what I want to know. You Good know? show. So it has been kind of a lesson in, in teaching us how to wait. And, you know, again, it's in God's timing. But, you know, we just want to encourage all of y'all, this talk today is to just encourage you to practice patience, practice patience with the people around you, you know, in this bustly time of year, but have patience with yourself as well. Yeah, good advice. Yeah. Um, don't get caught up, in other words, in this sense of urgency that we mm -hmm. tend to fall into. Take time for the moments. Uh, live as... One of my favorite guys, Richard Rohr, I really highly recommend his books. Mm -hmm. uh, Father Richard says, um, live in the eternal now. Be present with the people that you're with. Uh, take time to reflect. Take time, although it sounds cliche this time of year, take time to really, truly think about and consider what, what this season really is about. So, so slow down. Listen. Yeah. Wait for it. So when we were talking about prayer, um, we realized that the serenity prayer, kind of borrowed from the recovery community, is, really speaks to this topic. So if y'all would pray with me. God grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, courage to change the things we should, and the wisdom to tell the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting difficulty as a pathway to peace taking as Jesus did this world as it is, not as we would have it. Trusting you will make all things right as we surrender our lives to you so that we may live in the fullness of life Jesus intended. We ask in his name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, that's a beautiful prayer. That's so I'm going to finish um, the story about Joseph and all of our waiting for him. Uh, the waiting actually reached its crescendo after we got word that um, the courts were going to pass things through, in all honesty, probably because of a bribe. I didn't, can't verify that, but I remember <laughs> the one, uh, the, the, the lawyer's um, assistant walking with a manila envelope to the back of the court and then returning without it. <laughs> so I don't know that for sure, but um, in any case... We finally got word that this is going through. It's a little over five weeks waiting. And uh, what I didn't know at that point was that the most grueling wait was still in front of me. Um, and that was the flight home. It was by far, and I'm not exaggerating when I say it was by far the worst test of my patience I have ever had to endure. Put it this way, Joseph won the Guinness Book of World Records for the Worst behaved four-year-old on a nine-and-a-half-hour flight ever. He was the honey badger the entire way. I literally had scratch marks, bite marks. He had punched me. He was screaming. He didn't want to wear his seatbelt. I mean, people were so kind. They were trying to help me. It was, like, it, was, it was horrible. Of course, he was scared. He didn't understand what was going on. I mean, where are these people taking me? Who are these people? He had known me for a few weeks, you know. But... It was a very difficult um, flight. And the only consolation I had was that I knew that our whole family was waiting there, extended family and so on, and they all, and my wife had told me that um, we all have Santa hats, and they're all labeled with 
you know, appropriately for who we are to Joseph. So they said things like, you know, Joseph's grandpa, Joseph's aunt, Joseph's brother, sister, and so on. And so I was looking forward to that. And I said to Joseph before we, um, after we had landed, but before we had gotten off the plane, hey, our whole family is here to see us. So I want you to run up to them and give them a big squeeze for Christmas. He said, okay. So we get off the plane. And mind you, Joseph hadn't met most of them. So he didn't know who they were, and he didn't wait for me to point them out. <laughs> so he just ran off ahead of me and hugged the first big guy that he saw <laughs> with the greatest Christmas hug ever. And so I tell you that to, to wrap up that story because, you know, it is tough to wait on God, to wait for even the proper way to handle all the change that comes to our lives. But I want to encourage you that if we will keep our hand in his, the hand of the one who loves us, any waiting that we have to do will all be worth the wait. So we would like to remind you that God loves you. And so do we. Have Thanks a great for coming day. to Suncoast. <laughs> <laughs>